right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a meeting of the Fed and t and &E Committee. We are going to um, follow up on a conversation that has been ongoing for some time about the Parks Department's implementation of the Council's uh, Law 5214. And um, the, uh, the law that we passed, a, a major feature of it was a restriction on the use of uh, cosmetic pesticides and herbicides for homeowners on their lawns. And that was recently upheld in court, right? It's still being challenged, I think. But uh, <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, th that is a very sweeping requirement. There's no question about it. And, and you see examples of homeowners in some of these cases that are just shocking. You know, homeowners who have uh, read about one couple that every single day they, they douse their front yard, you know, with some of these chemicals. And uh, they, uh, they now feel that those chemicals cause them to get sick. And I think that really speaks to what the law was about. Um, but the council really struggled with the question of the professional application by the Parks Department in, in a, a very uh, complex set of settings and really not finding a consensus on the issue. The council asked the Parks Department to implement some specific changes and, uh, you know, to, to test some things out. And that was, to me, that was kind of the, that's where the council's directive really ended. Um, so I thought it would make sense for today's discussion to focus on what the law required and, and just see where we are in that and, uh, and then, you know, generally get a chance to hear from parks as they uh, have developed some learning from some of the programs they've implemented and, and other initiatives. So Pam has done a nice job with the packet, um, kind of laying out what the requirements were and what the parks has done. And there's some information that parks has provided in a lengthy response. Um, we've also received a number of communications. We've got a, a lengthy letter or a letter from Safe Grow Montgomery over the weekend, and uh, I'm sure we're all hearing from uh, advocates on social media. Um, so, Pam, why don't you uh, get us started with the packet? I understand Parks has a presentation, and uh, We'll go as, as uh, just to be evident on process issues. This is as a parks department. Parks department is overseen by the Fed committee, and so this is a Fed committee meeting. But the T&E committee requested to make it a joint, which is fine, and so we made it a joint meeting today. And um, you know, if the HHS committee had requested that, I probably would have said that that'd be okay too. And then I think we'd have every council member at the dais. You know, if anybody who wants to be part of the conversation is, is more than welcome. So um, uh, with that said, if the, if the chair of the TNE committee wanted to make any opening comments, you're welcome. Uh, otherwise, we'll proceed. Into the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't, I don't know if that I have any opening comments. Thank you all for doing this. I think, you know, the law, um, as far as parks goes, uh, notwithstanding the lawsuit for private residences, um, has been in place for three years. I think it's entirely appropriate that the public would like to see an oversight hearing. Of course, this legislation, the Healthy Lawns Act, um, was passed by the t and &E Committee. So, um, you know, I think we, we have a, a, a robust interest in making sure that it's uh, being implemented correctly and that the, um, the public has a, you know, understandable um, right to expect that as well, and that's, that's reflected in a lot of the correspondence. Thank you so much, Pam, for the great packet, and I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so today we do have the Parks Department here. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves as each of them speak. I think that's just easier. Um, but as you'll see in the packet, there were multiple changes that went into the county code, into Chapter 33B, um, and there are really four pieces that the Parks Department um, is in charge of implementing through the park system as it relates to pesticides. Um, and in all of these cases, except for the athletic fields, 
Um, you know, Parks has been providing a semi-annual report. They have a pesticide-free parks program. Um, they are following the pesticide usage, usage protocols that are in the code. You know, all of these things seem to be right on target. Um, the one piece that has not played out as was anticipated when the code was changed, the amendments made through 5214, um, were the athletic field pilot program. And as we're aware, um, the director sent a letter to the council back in April stating um, some of the issues they had with implementing it in the way that the code had instructed. So I'm not going to get into details with that. I do know that the director would like to make some remarks, the parks director, and then we're going to have this presentation by the parks department, which I think will be very educational. Um, and then I'd like to turn it back to see what the joint committee's questions are, what's not being answered, what didn't get covered, if that suits everybody. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike. Good morning. Uh, Mike Riley, Director of Parks. Thank you for having us today to give you an update on uh, Parks' role in compliance with uh, the county's pesticide law. I just wanted to start out with an affirmative statement um, that our parks uh, are safe for our patrons uh, and our staff. Um, it's pretty scary when you see words like uh, uh, toxic and cancer being associated so much with this issue and particularly tied to the park. So I do take this very, very seriously. And uh, we, we are constantly uh, keeping our eye to the state of the science and, and the art when it comes to uh, pesticides. Um, since 2014, when uh, Bill 5214 amended uh, 33B, which is the pesticide code, I've had a dedicated team of subject matter experts in the Parks Department meet monthly to make sure that we're in compliance with the law and to constantly be asking the question, um, how can we manage this big system effectively while minimizing the use of, uh, of pesticides? Um, I do want to talk a little bit about IPM, integrated pest management. That is not a new concept, and, and we have been a leader uh, nationwide in the implementation of IPM uh, for decades. And IPM uh, calls for the use of chemical pesticides as a last resort in the treatment of pests. I just want to reiterate, it's the last resort not the first resort. Sometimes when you pe hear people talk about an IPM model versus an organic model, it's associated with heavy use of pesticides. It's not. It's the least use of pesticides. Looking in, in our presentation, we'll get into the other mechanisms that are used prior to the use of uh, chemical pesticides. So you're, you're going to hear about many success stories in our presentation where we have found alternatives uh, to chemical control, so I won't go into any of them explicitly. I do want to emphasize that parks are not being used for cosmetic uh, pesticides, excuse me, are not being used for uh, cosmetic uh, purposes in the parks. They're used to control weeds, insects, animals, and pathogens that are harmful. Um, I've seen the image of, uh, of a dandelion uh, blooming in a lawn, and a, a message portrayed that the parks department just can't stand the image of a dandelion or some clover in a lawn. Uh, I just want to point out that of our uh, 1,600 acres of lawn in the parks, I'm not talking about athletic field, I'm talking about those community gathering places, uh, there's no use of pesticides except just for a couple exceptions, Brookside Gardens uh, being one of them. Um, as far as treatment on athletic fields, uh, there's been questions about can you tolerate weeds in athletic fields. You can tolerate some level of weeds if it's dandelion or clover, but there are more aggressive annual weeds and perennial weeds, excuse me, annual weeds and grasses that do outcompete turf grass that, are, that die. So you can have green in the August and September, and then you hit your first frost, and what that green cover is, is gone. So you, really, if you want to have high-end athletic fields, you cannot tolerate certain weeds and sometimes pesticides are the only way to control it. I also want to just talk about glyphosate versus the word pesticide. I see them used interchangeably. Obviously, there is a lot of focus right now on the health effects of glyphosate. We're following what's happening in California very co closely. Uh, but when you turn to the term pesticide, that's an extremely broad term that covers a whole host of different things. Herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, they may be chemicals, they may be organic or, or natural things. So just when, when you hear uh, operate a pesticide-free park system, that's a much broader discussion than how you're going to reduce or eliminate uh, glyphosate, which seems to be 
uh, and I want to explain glyphosate a little bit because it's not, it's not intuitive to anybody, particularly when it comes to athletic fields. Uh, you don't use glyphosate on the grass on an athletic field. It's a non-selective herbicide. It kills everything. You, we have used glyphosate on athletic fields to control weeds that grow in infields, the dirt part of the infield, or a warning track to remove uh, aggressive weed growth during the summer. And we're trying really to cut down and find alternatives uh, to that so we can uh, move forward with reducing or eliminating the use of glyphosate uh, on our fields. And as I said, uh, the word pesticide very broad, uh, insect repellent with DEET is a pesticide. There are organic pesticides like insecticidal soap you might use on a house plant if it gets bugs. So it's a very, very broad term. Another thing I just want to speak to briefly is what's happening in other jurisdictions. Sometimes I hear that we're behind the curve because there's successful implementation of pesticide-free programs in other jurisdictions. Our research is pretty much refuting that, that there are a lot of issues and problems. Uh, I just want to point out that every part of the country is different in terms of the pests that you have to deal with. Unfortunately for us, for athletic fields and grasses, we're in one of the hardest parts of the country. It's called the transition zone. The mid-Atlantic, as you know, can have very harsh winters and it can also have very hot and humid summers. So we do have problems with uh, turf grass diseases in our areas that maybe other parts of the country don't have. But that said, one of the cases you'll hear about is uh, Durango, Colorado, that tried to go pesticide free. I just read an interview with their 20-year tenured parks director who talked about why that did not work out for them. Uh, they did have organic turf consultants come in and, and help them, but at the end of the day, they determined that it was more costly and that their athletic fields and turf areas declined significantly. And then lastly, uh, the, I'm sure you're all aware of the petition that came to us from Safe Grow Montgomery. I just want to reply to a couple assertions that are in it. It's about immediately making all Montgomery parks pesticide free. That's the ask. All parks totally pesticide free. Uh, and it says, today 98% of our county's public parks and 100% of children's playing fields in the parks are still doused with toxic <coughs> pesticides as part of Montgomery Park's routine maintenance for common harmless weeds like clovers and uh, dandelions. That is not true. It's just, it's not, it's not a true statement. Um, I don't know where the number's coming from. Um, and uh, no park is being doused in pesticides. If you come visit one of our parks, the chance that you're going to encounter an area that's been treated with pesticides is, is, is relatively uh, slim. Um, you can find dandelions and buttercups in our, in our parks pretty much uh, anywhere you go. And the other statement I just want to speak to is that uh, Montgomery Parks has been lackluster in following the Healthy Lawns Act of 2015 since they lack transparency and public accountability and have minim minimally adhered to the law since it uh, passed four years ago. As Pam said, uh, we've complied. We've got all our 300, uh, approximately 300 playgrounds are now managed uh, without pesticides. As I said, pretty much all of our general lawn areas, we have 10 pesticide-free parks, and you'll hear about our plans to expand that program. Uh, you'll also hear a lot about a lot of success stories seeking alternatives to chemical pesticides. We do uh, pre-notify of pesticide applications on our website, and we've been giving the six-month reports that cover all our pesticide applications. And I think one of the most impressive things you'll see in this part report that will refute about us being non-responsive is that over the uh, five-year period between FY14 and FY18, we have reduced our uh, cost of pesticides procured to 25% in FY18 of what it was in FY14. So I'll just wrap up and say, I was, people ask about the park's mission, I always put it in two buckets. It's the bucket that, of all the recreational amenities and programs we have that our communities enjoy that make this a great place to live. And then the other half of the bucket is the conservation mission, the protection of natural resources. We actually acquire property solely for the purpose of clean air, clean water in Montgomery County and then, and then manages as such. So, we believe we're the good guys in this effort, not the bad guys. We want to participate in respectful, collaborative dialogue with all stakeholders that are interested in that. That would include Safe Grow Montgomery, our conservation and environmental groups, uh, our friends of groups, friends of Sligo, friends of Rock Creek, uh, our athletic field advocates who want better fields, as you know, and then the agricultural community, of course. Um, I did want to note this winter when I temporarily halted the use of glyphosate 
in the parks uh, to study the issue because we weren't really going to be using it in the winter anyway, I did get an outcry from our uh, tenant farmers about whether this applied to them because they were very, very concerned and nervous. And I, I made a clarification that it did not apply to them. And I just bring that up to give you, you know, to reiterate, there are multiple stakeholders in this discussion uh, as we look forward to, um, you know, pesticide reduction in the parks. With that, I will turn it over to David Vismera. He is the Division Chief of our Horticulture, Forestry, and Environmental Education Division. It's a mouthful, but uh, he's going to walk you through a number of slides that hopefully will answer a lot of the questions you've sent to us. And then, of course, we're happy to participate in Q&A as long as you wish. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. And thanks to the Council for giving us an opportunity to brief you on Montgomery Park's ongoing efforts to reduce pesticides. Uh, presenting with me is Holly Thomas, my assistant division chief. She'll be taking over the second part of the presentation. So to start off, whoops, here we go already. There we go. Touchy thing. It's the roller you have there. Okay, to start off, here's an outline of what we're going to be covering today. Since there are new council members, I will start off with some background information and we'll give you definitions as we go along. Okay. Uh, the next slide is about the semi-annual pesticide use report. The semi-annual pesticide use report is a requirement of Maryland Code 52-14 and is submitted every six months. This is our sixth report. Previous reports are on our parks website. This report includes the following pesticide-free pilot parks, pesticide-free playgrounds, athletic fields pilot, organic listed product use, pesticide use protocols, informing the public, and the attachment of pesticide use data. This report was submitted to the council early so you would have it as a reference for this briefing. An updated version including data through June 30th will be submitted by July 15th. Requirements of Section 33B-14 of Montgomery County Code, we've already, um, Pam has already talked a little bit about it, Mike has talked further about it, so I don't think I need to go over specifics again for you, but this is a list of what were required. Well, actually, I, I think it's really important that we focus on what the law required. Okay. Because, for example, some have said that you were supposed to go completely pesticide-free in all of the parks. That was not what the law required. So I will take time and go through it then. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So let me proceed with reading then. This sli slide lists the requirements for parks under 33B-14 of the Montgomery County Code. Ten parks were designated to start the pesticide-free parks program. In the very near future, we'll be adding more pesticide-free parks. Protocols have been developed. Staff training programs emphasize these maintenance practices so they can implement these protocols. An example of this would be string trimming around trash cans as the first option instead of spraying. A process is in place for public notification of planned pesticide applications on the park's website. Semi-annual pesticide use reports have been submitted on schedule. All athletic fields are being maintained using integrated pest management practices. We will explain this term in a little later slide. And regarding the plan for transitioning fields to listed pesticides, this will be delayed until results are gathered from the proposed alternative playing field pilot Sorry. program. Sorry. What are you, are you now, uh, where, are you, where are you in the presentation? I'm just reading down the list and explaining okay. the list. Right. Okay. Is that going? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, in regards to the f pilot program, more on the athletic field pilot pr program will come later in the presentation. Go. So why do we manage pests? Pests cause damage and create numerous challenges in maintaining park infrastructure, protecting plants, and ensuring visitor safety. And there's a list of the reasons why we um, take care of pests. And just to go down that list, uh, preventing harm. The slides here, poisonous plants such as poison ivy, seen in the photo on the right, although native, can cause severe reactions to our patrons upon contact. Poison ivy is a common plant growing along unmaintained areas of parkland. Carolina horse nettle, which is also pictured up there, is poisonous as one of the most challenging weeds to manage in some of our playgrounds. And then stinging insects nesting in playgrounds must be managed immediately to prevent harm to children. Improve safety and accessibility. The photo on the left is the train at Wheaton Regional Park. Tracks need to be free of weeds for safe operation. The photo on the right shows a weed-infested ball field warning track. The warning tracks 
on athletic field diamonds are a section of a sports field typically devoid of vegetation. That provides a change in surface texture such that an athlete can sense without looking the proximity to a hazard such as a fence, post, or wall and to try to avoid it when running to catch a ball. And then to protect the plant health, we control pests to protect the forest ca tree canopy of Montgomery County and to preserve landscape trees, shrubs, and other desirable plants. First photo on the left is the county champion white ash, white ash in Sandy Spring that receives regular insecticide treatments to protect it from emerald ash borer. The next photo shows a young tree with weed growth around the trunk. The right photo shows a tree with string trimmer damaged. This damage occurs when a mulch area around a tree is not installed to reduce weeds. And then also for controlling invasive species, invasive species in natural areas are highly damaging to the ecosystem and to native plants. Shown here are invasive weeds being removed with a forestry mulcher machine which we purchased. And then the other slide is porcelain berry vine climbing up and smothering a tree. And then one of the most important reasons, maintaining infrastructure. Detrimental vegetation includes grasses and woody plants that are destructive or compromise the function of infrastructure by growing in cracks along the roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, curbs, and guardrails. The one, number one cause of pavement deterioration is water in the subgrade. Plant growth in cracks and joints create pathways for water infiltration. String trimming is not a good choice because it causes crumbling infrastructure to break up further. Damage has been caused by these crumpled pieces when they are thrown into the air as projectiles. And then finally, the last reason, comply with local and state federal laws. State and federal laws require landowners to manage and control noxious weed growth on their property. Shown here are a few examples of noxious weeds on park property that we are mandated to control, which is the bull thistle, Canada thistle, and Johnson grass. And then the last one here prevents significant economic damage. Because of high use and demand, significant investments are made in maintaining athletic fields. With ball fields, maintenance practices need to ensure consistent, predictable play for the teams. And just to show you a photo here, if you look at a photo closely here, the light area, notice the two colors of grass on this slide. The annual grass weeds are a light color. When these die in the fall, large areas of bare soil will be exposed. Bare soil is prone to erosion and creates unsafe playing conditions for athletes. This is why it is important to control these annual weeds with selective herbicides and turf fields. Okay, wait, can you pause there for a minute? Because this is, this is a big one. So I think there is a perception that you, know, you might use uh, herbicides on a patch you know, of weeds in a field, or you run out, you see a dandelion, you run out into the field and you, you spray the dandelion, kind of like what a homeowner might do, frankly, right. uh, is identify every little patch in their yard. Uh, and I think the reaction to that would be like, why? Why would you do that? Like, who cares if there's a little dandelion or a little patch of grass in, a, in an athletic field? But this is the issue, that if you don't control for those, you're saying over time the field will become taken over by those grasses that then die when it cools down. Correct, yeah. And so the whole field ultimately, or a large share of the field, Correct. will be taken over. And, and then you have a very different kind of field. Correct. And then in response to spraying just one dandelion or two dandelions, with integrated pest management, IPM, which we'll explain in a little bit, there is a tolerance level for insects, weeds, and pests. And one or two dandelions is not going to affect the field or a turf grass situation. You don't treat for that. You allow that. Well, there's a tolerance level. If there's 10,000 dandelions, that gets to a point where there's a problem. And I don't know if 10,000 is the right number to throw at you. But I think the, the, the underlying point is that this, this, uh, this shows what can happen, and that is not what, when that dies back, that field is no longer a even grass field, and then that creates a different set of issues in the athletic program. It is, and again, it depends on the type of weed too. Uh, if it's going to be be seeding prolifically, it's it, we're going to address it quickly. If it's just a small patch, we're going to see where it goes. There's tolerance. I guess that's the key word to emphasize here. There is tolerance out there. We're not just spraying every time one weed, two insects appear. There's a tolerance level. All right. Yeah. Sure. So can you clarify what that's that's good to hear. What's the tolerance level? 
it varies a lot depending on the weed, the insect, and everything. Can you elaborate on it? Um, I th I'll, so I'm going to shift to Holly. I'm Holly Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Holly. In speaking with the athletic field manager uh, last week, um, we talked about what triggers a renovation, and uh, we didn't have a concrete percentage, but somewhere around 50% weeds turf is when we're looking at, okay, the balance is starting to be pushed towards weeds because they're much more aggressive than the turf. And so 50% weeds is when... So when 50% of the field is taken over by weeds, and at that point, what do you do with the field? Then we do a renovation. Which, what does that mean? So, should we bring up the athletic... We may want to bring up... Yeah, yeah. Well, while you're, while you're waiting, why don't you show them the image of what this looks like when it's done? I don't think we have that on the slides. I don't think that's the next slide. No. Mm -hmm. I think can mention. Good morning, I'm Cliff Driver, Athletic Field Program Manager for Montgomery Parks. Hi, Cliff. Hi. <laughs> so if we can go back one one side. Okay, let's see if we can do it. No, the other way. There we go. Oh no. Yeah, use the click, not the roll, I think. The gray. So the slide we're looking at is, is a local park. This picture was taken last week. Um, what you're seeing is the light colored being uh, annual grasses, crabgrass. Your darker, uh, kind of in your upper left hand corner, if you will, that is our perennial turf grass. So over the years, this annual grass has the ability to crowd out our perennial turf grasses. Um, we are actively trying to increase our irrigation seeding and nutrient program. Uh, one of the biggest things that we have right now that is our focus is a full nutrient implementation program. Uh, that will help us try to compete. But at the end of the day, annual grasses, specifically crabgrass and goosegrass, has the ability during the active growing season to outcompete our perennial desired turf grass. When frost comes, that plant will unfortunately die on its own. Uh, right there, if that was all it was, it would be, well, it's not that bad. It seems even. It's grass. You could play on it. What's the problem, right? Essentially, yes, sir. In, in a local park setting, if, if that uh, crabgrass was a perennial rather than an annual, uh, we would, for the most part, allow that to, to be maintained in that nature. Uh, but for uh, player safety as well as environmental impacts, when that becomes bare dirt, we're now losing uh, you know, sediment and nutrients into our waterways which is a problem environmentally for us, as well as playability issues because essentially you're playing on bare dirt. Uh, now that crabgrass that you're seeing right there won't re-germinate uh, until about April of next year. So we'll go through some of our mid-October as well as all of November uh, with play on the fields as well as uh, March 15th, April, and then late April to start germinating. It really won't come out until about mid-May. Sorry, yes. may I jump in? Um, so below 50%, Holly, you don't do any applications? Or you just do it for, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you don't do any cosmetic ones, you just do it for noxious weeds and invasives? So right. for the most part, uh, the industry kind of under, or the industry has accepted that when you get to f around 50% of uh, weeds in a field, mm -hmm. that the, that's what triggers a full renovation on a field. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're still working right now on establishing set thresholds for applications. The 50% is that we would need to start over. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you've accepted the fact that you, you, you need to move in a different direction. You need right. to start fresh. Right. You've got to pivot and go a different way. What do you do before 50%? You're doing sort of essentially a plant census, right? You're at 25% weeds and 75% grass. What approaches do you take at that point? So we're still working on in, uh, establishing thresholds. We're looking at three different tiers for our parks now. Right now, you would understand it to be known as two tiers. You have your local park standard, and you have your recreation on regional park standard. Uh, we are showing that we don't have the current inventory to be able to accomplish the amount of games that we need, and a game surface is very different from what a practice surface would be. So we're looking at establishing an intermediate level that's in between there. Uh, what that would do is establish a higher standard for a local park that would be used for a game setting. Um, and the thresholds would correspond with each of the three, the three settings. And we're still working on trying to put that together so we can roll that out uh, specifically to you guys. And that's part of an athletic field improvement plan uh, uh, 
similar topic, but right. somewhat different. So you might, you might have three tiers in the future, not the, the rigid 50%, but below the threshold, what do you do to control the weeds? In, in what circumstances do you apply pesticides? That's what people are going to ask. Well, so I think where we're at is we're looking at, at threshold levels. Uh, our recreation regional parks have lower thresholds, and we're looking at establishing very rigid thresholds for what we're doing right now. It follows an IPM, but it's um, it, it, it's due to the sport and the field. Sometimes it can be somewhat interpretive uh, about the number exactly what you're looking for. But we have we're looking at economic injury thresholds as well as player safety thresholds uh, that in which we would make an application. I think what the council, if I may, I think what the council member is asking. Let's say let's say this was only a twenty percent mm -hmm. covered. What would you do at that point? Do you try to treat those weeds if it's 20% on an athletic field, or do you have to just wait for it to get to the 50% and right. then do a renovation? Is that is that yeah. what you're asking? Yeah. So this being a local park, again, we go back to our tiers. <clears throat> Pardon me. If this was at a regional or the intermediate, the mid-level would be very different. Uh, where we're at on this being a local park right now, this is an irrigation, seeding, and fertilizing we would not currently apply pesticide using our current maintenance standards to this field. You would just continue to uh, plant grass into the field at, with aerification and, and treat it and try to compete, allow the, the grass to out-compete the weed as best you can. Exactly. Aerification, that, nutrients, and overseeding, presumably. Those are your three pillars, right. essentially, of, of turf grass maintenance. Right. Uh, we're trying to increase all three pillars. Uh, our main focus right now is the implementation of a nutrient plan. So what, what limits your ability to expand that program? Because I think people would be really happy to hear that, and many of us would want to help you succeed with that. Uh, we're constrained in some of our budgets uh, for, for new equipment. Uh, our equipment for specialized equipment for turf grass is extremely expensive, uh, as well as our personnel costs that we, uh, we need to, to look at some increased personnel. Uh, as well as materials. Uh, nutrients are, are, are a very expensive uh, portion of athletic field maintenance. Uh, and in our maintenance standards, somehow we got irrigation and seeding in there, but we, we currently don't have nutrients. So we're absorbing our nutrient applications uh, without a, a set funding, uh, you know, amount, if you will, for, for a maintenance standard. Okay, so uh, just to really trying to be very basic here. It's really helpful. Uh, when you have, this is a local park. This is not a permitted field, or this is this is North Chevy Chase. Uh, oh. This is the top field at North Chevy Chase. This, my, this field my kids use all the time. Okay, <laughs> so uh, this is this is permitted. This is permitted. This is a, uh, a soccer field. Kind of, you can see a little bit of the goal on the top left, uh, and there's an infield to your, which would be on your right hand side. And uh, if. So this one you say is tipping towards fifty percent. Is that is that what I, is that what you'd said or? Uh, I think we're probably beyond fifty percent at this. Point. Beyond fifty percent, and when it was at twenty five percent, you were tried. Did you do you treat a field at twenty five percent, or what, what will be your your strategy in the future? You will treat occasionally, with what? What will you treat a? Uh, there are some selective herbicides. Uh, we don't use non selectives for turf grass. Uh, as we had mentioned before, that's a uh, that's a, a a complete vegetation removal, and we're not looking at that until possibly we get into a, a complete renovation. Uh, we would look at the possibility for selective herbicides uh, if and when it meets a threshold. Like I said, we're still working on uh, so coming is this, up with it. So, is the, has this field been treated with herbicides? It has not. It has not. Yeah. I'd like to say, um, in speaking with Cliff. A lot of the local park athletic fields, these rectangles do not get treated. Right. That's been my understanding. I mean, no, but they need a lot more inputs to be quality fields, as you right. can see. Like, this is not acceptable to have this percentage of weeds when it's dying back, and then you have the, the bare dirt there. Right. Um, okay. And then you're driving towards a three tier <clears throat> system, which will have a different treatment model for each tier. Um, and, uh, and generally, you've said that uh, you know you don't treat playgrounds 
at all with any pesticides or herbicides. That was banned in the law. That was banned in the law. Mm -hmm. So we have 100% pesticide-free playgrounds. Um, and and you're, you're working towards an athletic field model that is more refined and allows for a balance that you're seeking in different types of uses. Yes, that's right. If I could just help clarify, today we have our regional and recreational parks, which are fenced, restricted use fields that you pay a higher fee to play on. And people expect the higher standard of quality. Those are like the great fields that have, you know, Those markings. are in Wheaton Regional and Cabin John Regional and Ridge Road. And people expect a high-end, high-quality field when they show up. And Competition those, level. In, in, in our three-tier system, that's you, you guessed right. In our three-tier system, we're, we're moving towards calling them competition fields that will have their own set of maintenance standards, including when and if pesticides are used. Today, on those fields, you will have, see, you will have pre- and post-emergent herbicides, weed and feed. You will have... Uh, uh, disease treatments, fungicides, and things like that. So today we are using those types of pesticides on those fields. Then you move to the majority of our fields, which are in the community parks or local parks, unrestricted, unfenced. A, a lot of them serve game purposes. The, most of our games are played in local parks for both youth and adults. They may be permitted, but they're not they're, fenced. They, they're not fenced, but they are permitted. But they also provide for walk-on use when there is no permit holder on the field. Those are the biggest challenge. And those right now we're looking at breaking into a two-tier system, two, two, two tiers, a game experience, and then perhaps the lowest tier is a practice experience where maybe you get down to the point where you just say for that tier you will not ever use. I would so, like to see you get to that. Pesticide. I'd like it to be clear to we're, me. We're, we're working, we're in the middle of working through that right now, which is why Cliff maybe is struggling to be very specific on some of these answers. But that's something in the next report we can come back to you with that I'm very excited about. Great. Okay, let's keep going through the presentation. Hey, Cliff, Cliff got two more slides on the ball fields. Okay. You're doing uh, great, Cliff. You're doing great, man. <laughs> Okay, the next slide is about weeds on an infield. Infields are supposed to be clear clay, but this one has been overtaken by weeds. Mechanical removal by dragging weed bar and handheld tools is, tools is the primary, primary method now used on these skinned areas. So most of our fields now, uh, we're doing these mechanical removal of weeds, not using Roundup. This is the park, Casey, you and I visited this on your park tour. And then the next one is regarding fungus. This is probably one of the most dreaded problems that we have is fungus coming into turf grass, especially with our elite, elite fields. This is a photo of spring dead spot on Bermuda grass. Fungal diseases like this can spread rapidly and de devastate a field. And again, one of the only things we can do against that is to spray fungicides. So let's talk a little bit about the definition of a pesticide. I think Mike referred to that in his opening remarks, but just to help familiarize you with a couple of terms, uh, what is a pest? Pest can be weeds, insect, animals, and pathogens. A pesticide is a substance for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. And then the types of pesticides, again, pesticide is used as a general term, but these are the three types of pesticides used in parks. Herbicides are used to treat weeds, invasives, and noxious plants. Insecticides are used to protect plants after a tolerance level has been surpassed or when insects pose a health hazard. Fungicides are used after a tolerance level has been reached or as an example you have seen in a previous slide on spring dead spot used to prevent the spread of a quick spreading fungus. And then there's listed and organic pesticides. Listed pesticides are products from two lists. One lists organic ingredients, and a second list includes products that pose minimum risk. Some examples of ingredients for weed control are seen on the left side of the slide. We have been using some of these and trying out some of these in the parks. And then regarding IPM, integrated pest management, for over 25 years, Montgomery Parks has been practic practicing integrated pest management on parkland. IPM combines strategies for long-term suppression or prevention of plant pest problems. 
These strategies may be implemented individually or combined to successfully suppress a, a pest. And we list them right there. We're going to go through each one of these. Uh, mechanical and physical control. IPM strategies include mechanical or physical control to remove or block the pest. These are pictures of string trimming weeds on a, on a path and on a driveway. The photo on the far right is our re recently purchased foam machine in operation. Parks purchased two machines at a cost of $102,000. This machine uses a plant-based solution and foam heated to a high temperature to kill weeds. We had those delivered about a week ago. They will be out in parks probably next week if the rain ever stops. But also, the, nice, the good thing about this is you can use this during the rain as compared to chemical or other applications. This people can be out in the rain and this works in the room. The foam is not toxic itself. It's either. a plant-based solution, and it's heated. And this, this is an alternative to Roundup. This is a method that kills the plant. It's non-selective. It kills beds. the plant and the root. And this is for, because you say it's an alternative for Roundup, and it's, it's, it's not being used on a, it's not being used in an athletic field. This is no. for well, possibly, tracks. We'll, tra and we'll check out warning tracks. Warning tracks. Warning tracks, yeah, yeah. but in fields, uh, maybe. this is cracks in pavements and tennis courts and basketball courts and the mulch rings around beneficial plantings, trees. And we have, in working with, with the distributor for this, we have tried this in grass areas selectively for spot treating for noxious weeds. Um, it hasn't worked well. It looks like multiple applications are going to be used, but if you if you spot treat with it, there's a possibility we can use it for that as well in turf areas. So it's, these are new machines. We're just trying them out. There's a lot of, a lot of work to be done to see what we can use these for and, and uh, what they're going to work on. And you bought these because you're under the direction to reduce your use of herbicides and pesticides. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Cultural controls techniques include the selection and support of healthy plants, and encouraging and maintaining healthy so soils. Deep tine aeration for turf, as shown here in the picture, is an excellent cultural technique for re reducing compaction and improving soils. And then there's biological controls, which are used to enhance the balance between pests and predators. This is a picture of what's called a mealybug destroyer beetle. Uh, these are purchased from vendors and released in the conservatory of Brookside Gardens to combat, combat mealybugs. Biological controls are released in the gardens conservatory and production greenhouses at Brookside Gardens. And these are a lot more expensive than conventional pesticides, but they tend to, to, we tend to have some good success with them. And then as a last resort, there's chemical controls. Chemical control is used when other strategies fail. This shows staffs injecting the champion ash tree with an insecticide. Chemical controls are chosen using four criteria. Effective, effectiveness of controlling <coughs> pests, safe for non-targets, short-lived in the application area, and low toxicity to humans. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Holly Thomas. I'm going to talk about pesticide-free, or pesticide reduction efforts in Montgomery County, excuse me. Oh. Left one. Yes, thank you. Okay. So Parks has established a pesticide-free parks program. Ten parks have been implemented as pesticide-free. These parks are located throughout the county as shown on the map. And as you can see, the black stars there, we have selected parks that are located throughout Montgomery County. Additional parks will be added to this list in the near future. Pesticide reduction efforts in these parks have included mechanical weed removal instead of pesticides, and modification of design elements, such as reducing landscape beds. We also attempt to repair cracks in our courts to reduce weeds. Park staff formally evaluate the parks in this pilot program twice a year. Findings since the program's inception include an increase in weeds in paved surfaces, infrastructure deterioration, and weed competition <coughs> with young trees that are trying to establish themselves in the landscape. Additional funding and staff are needed to maintain standards for the current pesticide-free parks and future additions to this program. So each slide here with the pesticide reduction efforts, we're going to go through the efforts we've made, the challenges we're seeing, and then our needs moving forward. Courts, as I mentioned, uh, string trimming is the only viable alternative effort for removing, for removing weeds from cracks at the moment, but it's not perfect. 
Quartz with crumble, crumbling surfaces deteriorate further when string trimming dislodges debris from the cracks. And color-coded quartz surfaces cannot be managed by flame weeding because it damages the painted surface. Funding is needed to renovate quartz to reduce the number of cracked surfaces. Okay, so that was mentioned in the packet. So you mean when you say that you have to rebuild the quartz, so you're going to, have to demolish it and build a new quartz? Yes. What you mean? So quartz servicing life is 20 years. Our current funding cycle allows replacement at 40 years. So we have an estimate on repairing a double tennis court is $21,000, and that would be repairing those cracks and redoing the surfacing, which would get us over the hump to a full renovation, which would be sixty to 80000 Yeah, so the, the point we're making here, and this we discussed this quite a bit, is, is if just speaking to basketball tennis courts, and I, I should memorize the number, but it's hundreds and hundreds of them that, that we manage. 600, Mike. 600. Um, the point we're making is if, and you'll see this in our next CIP request, if we were fully funded for maintenance and life cycle renovation at our desired interval, we wouldn't have cracks with weeds growing in them. And when they do rarely occur, we would have the maintenance staff to go out there and blow them out and feel them with sealant so that weeds don't grow. Our problem is that we're not there. We have a lot of old courts with cracks, and the most cost-effective way in the past to go out and deal with that was to be spray Roundup on the weed growth because the weeds, the roots go down in the ground, the roots die, and then that leaves a pathway for water, which advances the deterioration of the court. Pesticide-free playgrounds. Thanks to the council's support, two crews were approved in fiscal year 19 budget to support playground maintenance. Current reduction efforts include mechanical weed removal, playground border replacement, and testing alternative products. Problem weed species such as Bermuda grass, which appears and grows rapidly, continues to be a problem and can compromise child safety. So that's a, is that one of the playgrounds in the pesticide-free program? Yes, it is. So what are you going to do with all those? Is that, is that where you're going to use the flamethrower? We will show you. We don't usually use the flamethrower in a mulched area because then flames will really... <laughs> Sorry, my G.I. Joe uh, <laughs> childhood is getting there. We love volunteers. <laughs> okay, so yeah, th these weeds are a problem. And in the next slide, we'll show you um, our staff, the labor intensiveness in getting rid of these weeds out of the mulch. That so weeds compromise the shock attenuation provided by clean mulch. Over 1,500 linear feet of playground border was replaced this year. Border replacement helps slow weed encroachment. The goal is to visit each playground twice a month from March to November for weed removal. This is not being met. To maintain standards and safety for 273 playgrounds, two additional crews and equipment will be requested. And we are going to try the foam stream in the playground and then another product called Adios, which is basically like a bag of salt. It's like a salt-based product that will kill the weeds that we're seeing. Okay, so here is this. These photos demonstrate hand removal of playground weeds. And as mentioned, Bermuda grass has extensive roots in the playground wood surfacing and the entire plant must be removed with forks, shovels, and the use of a sod cutter. Is this the same Bermuda grass that we plant? <laughs> yeah. In the yeah. It is, yeah. So it's kind so of we a don't like sword. it here. Right. And no video. Right. Okay. We had a great video on the end of this sod cutter being used for removal, but it's not coming up. Okay. Brookside Gardens, um, pesticide reduction efforts. As you can see from this list, Brookside is currently employing numerous reduction practices in their continued effort to be as green as possible. Beneficial insects are used routinely in the conservatory, and Stephanie Overly, the director, told me they spent $6,700 this year on beneficial insects in the conservatory, which is a big chunk of change. Nematode contaminated soil was replaced in conservatory beds instead of using a chemical fumigant. This photo here shows a solarization method, which uses a plastic cover to heat up soil from the sun to eliminate weeds. So Brookside Gardens challenges the diversity of plants at Brookside, insects and diseases on plants, and persistent weeds in the turf create maintenance challenges. 
Now this is a photo of Rose Midge, which is currently being addressed with an IPM program. Fertilizing is one component that encourages rose growth, rose growth to outpace the midge attack. In the spring, Brookside treated lawn areas with an herbicide to improve lawn density and health by reducing weed competition. Brookside staff have estimated costs for an organic turf program modeled after similar programs in public gardens in New York City. The cost to implement this program the first year is $160,000. What is that based on, please? I mean, I know it's based on an estimate from New York, but like, what does that money go to? We'll bring Stephanie Overly, director, up to explain that. I, I want to say I think we should move to Brookside being a you know a kind of a leading best practice of par part of your learning and uh, your 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 a test bed for organic turf management. Uh, so I, I think. I think probably everybody would agree that that, mm -hmm. that would be nice, and and certainly. Uh, but I'm surprised by the by the price tag to start. So I'd like to know more about that, please. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Oberly, the director of Brookside Gardens. Um, that number came from a visit that a number of my staff on our green team took to New York City, specifically to look at what other public gardens were doing to manage their turf, and. Um, what we learned is that it's, it's time consuming and expensive, um, both in terms of materials and supplies and also labor. And so when we came back, one of the measures we took immediately, because we had a vacancy, we converted one of our career staff positions from a custodian to be someone solely responsible for turf. So we took the resources we had and, and reinvested in the labor component, because that's something we could do. Um, and then we started working up this number, which is quite large. Um, but in order to manage our turf organically, we would need to, like Cliff said, increase the nutrients, the aeration, and the seeding. And that's all expensive. You, you, we would also need to buy new equipment so we'd have it on the property because those measures take place not on a twice a year basis, but on a monthly basis. So it would also mean an increase in labor because we'd be basically having someone running one of these aeration machines, top dressing with organic uh, soil amendments and seeding constantly during the growing season. And that's all costly and more than this one reallocated position is able to do. Okay, so this would be, in this instance then, it's not that parks and it's, you know, Cliff's equipment and everything is coming into Brookside once a month you're saying you need you'd really need to have your own program just for Brookside yes. and that's I assume that's where is this a one-time well it's not a one-time expense but is, is, is a lot of that money equipment money or is Some that of the money is equipment but as you know labor career staff positions is costly oh yeah so that's an expense that would be ongoing and also the materials and supplies the soil amendments would also be an ongoing expense um, I mean, I know like Gaithersburg uses organic turf management, and the city does. Have you talked to them about their program? No, we haven't talked to Gaithersburg. We did. We actually had a roundtable with a bunch of local municipalities to talk about turf practices. Um, we talked to Smithsonian, Architect of the Capitol, City of Gaithersburg, to see what everyone was working with. Because, I mean, even in D.C., the compaction issues that they're seeing are, are huge. You know, the Capitol has a lot of traction going on. So we went with them to learn about their experiences. And they're having a tough time um, without regular inputs as well. So uh, staffing is always a challenge. And the climate, of course, is a challenge. And then the compaction issue with all the people and the population that are walking around on the turf at Brookside. Is there just that one lawn that's by the pond? Or is there more? I guess I'm trying to imagine it's, there's turf throughout the there's turf kind of throughout the property in the Goody Garden area, which is probably the area that you're refer referring to. That's the largest turf area. And we're struggling with that area because um, of uh, construction damage. There's this large swath that when we um, drained and dredged the Goody Garden ponds, the construction damage is still something that we're trying to overcome. That's probably the most damaged area. And then there's a large area below the formal gardens and then smaller turf areas throughout. 
Casey, did you want to say something? Well, I, I just want to put this in context because on page five of your packet, there's a table near the bottom of the page. It shows how much the Parks Department has spent on pesticides for the last five years. And I, I want to highlight not just that it's gone way down. It was over, it was almost, uh, well, it was over $53,000 in FY14 versus FY18 was uh, $14,624. So that's, the point one is it's gone way down. We are minimizing use, and I think this is good evidence that we are not just following the letter of the law, but the spirit in trying to ratchet down the amount of chemicals that we're using in the park system. But point two, and I think it fits in with this, is if you're talking about $20,000 to renovate a single tennis court or $160,000 just to get an organic program going in one park facility, admittedly it's a marquee park facility, but that's one, one location in the county versus $14,000 for the entire park system's pesticide use, I think it really highlights in a way that I'm not sure is quite coming through when you look at each one of these pieces individually, the total picture is, of course we want to reduce chemical use. We're not interested in using any more chemicals than necessary. A, because we do recognize they're toxic, and B, they create certain other problems for uh, the administration of the, of the park system. But the flip side of that is the cost of trying to go and take each one of these issues, athletic fields, tennis courts, parking lots, Brookside Gardens, cumulatively is quite substantial. And while I think we would not be in a position to give you the total bill, it, if you wanted to go whole, to a drastic shift away, if you just said you can't use pesticide tomorrow, the cost impact of operating the park system as we know it would be enormous at a time when we don't have the money. When I say we, I mean the, the collective we. The county does not have the funding. So we, are, we welcome the council's direction to try to minimize pesticide usage. But, the, but it, it, realistically, I think this is giving you at least some anecdotally some pieces of what that would mean in terms of the cost of operating the park system without the use of, of chemicals. Yeah, I mean, I do think the you, you're going to have to send something to that effect, you know, because I think the bill required a plan, and I think you have a better sense now of what that means and to what extent it actually what what the implications are of of that aspiration, and so you know, I, I think to fulfill that requirement, you're going to have to send something. I, I don't know when. Exactly. And, and we can do that. One of my concerns is that number is going to be so large that, the, that many of the people who want us to go further will think that it's overstated. They'll think we're exaggerating. But I think that some of the, of the pieces of this you're starting to see individually why, as a total, it's going to add up to a, a very large number. And we can prepare that, but I just think everybody needs to not only be prepared for it to be a big number, but understand that the constituent elements of that on a facility by facility basis are quite substantial and in excess of anything we've been able to get budget to support, for example, on replacing tennis courts. Like we can't, we're on a 40 year life cycle replacement for a 20 year asset. That's true of parking lots, it's true of all of our playgrounds, all of our park facilities. We're not even close to being able to match that. Councilmember Fritz. Thank you uh, for that. I'm, I'm learning quite a bit uh, here. Admittedly, I'm not an expert in any of this or much of anything at all, uh, uh, but try my best. Uh, that said, um, a couple things. One, uh, I just wanted to note, and I think this is not the first time, but you know, there was a savings plan that uh, came in that we rejected based on financial constraints dealing with invasive species, not specific to pesticides, but the invasive species program that we rejected specifically for the for this challenge that you know that doesn't change the invasiveness or the number of uh, species that occur if we just don't have the funding to deal with it and it just gets worse and it either makes the you know deteriorates the facilities with the cost that you talked about on tennis courts and basketball courts and parking lots and makes the costs 
uh, significantly more. Uh, I do think it would be helpful because I think that this is, you know, an important conversation, you know, to really put on paper what the financial constraints are. I don't think that this conversation is exclusively a financial one based on what I've heard, you know, that there are other challenges, and I think it's important for that to be uh, part of this discussion, at least if we're kind of reconciling everything that we've heard so far today. If you had all the money in the world, could we have the quality of the ball fields, et cetera, that we want based on the equipment that is available currently, even if money was of no consequence, which of course it is because we compete with other uh, priorities. And you know, I think it will be interesting to see what the, you, know, you called it a flamethrower, I think I'd call it like a veggie steamer, but uh, yeah, because it, it's like vegetable water with, with steam, I think, uh, or something similar to that. But that notwithstanding, it would be interesting to see how that does work on warning tracks and parking lots, you know, on uh, playgrounds and the other, you know, and we just don't know. I mean, until we've seen how it works in this climate on the facilities that we have, what the efficacy is, and then whether or not it makes sense, maybe you'll come back with a request. But I, I do think it would be helpful to, uh, to uh, Councilmember Reamer's point to have what the financial constraints are, not just on going pesticide free, but like on the maintenance you know, that you mentioned before. I mean, one of the reasons why you have the invasive species on the basketball courts and on the tennis courts is because you don't, we don't have what is considered to be best practice life cycle maintenance funding. And so I think if we got a full picture of that when you're prepared to do it, not only of what it would look like to go, you know, to, to you know, at Brookside Garden, you know, maybe take, you know, maybe take one or two facilities and do something more realistic or, uh, you know, in this time constraint, or maybe do it completely and say, you know, here are the tens of millions, you know, of dollars that it would cost in order to do it. But, you know, if you're hand weeding, that's a, a pretty significant amount of time that it would require and personnel that it would require uh, in order to do it. But I also think that adding to that the, the maintenance that you're already backlogged on and one of the reasons why some of these challenges are being created, weeds happen and you're, you're fighting it because you're not able to, on an everyday basis, have one superintendent of one field who's there every day hand weeding, you know, or spraying or whatever uh, the case. And I think that that would be uh, important. But I do also think, at least from what I've heard today, that, um, and I just want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but that it's not exclusively a financial issue, that that's a big part of it, but that there are other challenges as you mentioned with some of the other counterparts in the region that they're facing, and you didn't mention finances. I'm sure they would mention finances, but you didn't mention finances. You mentioned other problems. Can you just confirm that yeah. if we gave you an unlimited amount of money, would there be other issues related to this in terms of implementing? Well, I'll, I'll let these folks answer that, but I think I want to come back to that image of the crabgrass on the uh, field at North Chevy Chase because uh, I wish we had the before and after image. That picture was just taken last week. But in the winter, that will be dirt because that crabgrass will die and it will go away. And then when you try to play on it, first of all, you got sediment, you know, coming off the field into the stream. It's not good for water quality. But player safety, especially when it rains, that turns into a giant mud pit. And you can't play on it. Or if you do try to play on it, you're going to be slipping and sliding all over the place. The chance of getting hurt, a torn ACL, those sort of things go go up uh, dramatically. And to your point, I'm not sure, and I'll let these folks, folks, the experts answer, but, you know, unless you want to renovate every field that gets taken over by weeds, by crabgrass and, and goosegrass, every time you get to that 50% threshold, which is would be a substantial amount of, mo amount of money, I'm not sure there's anything you could do, even if you had the best turf management program uh, on the planet to keep those those fields actually covered with with vegetation of any kind. But I'll let Cliff uh, answer that. Okay. So we do, I mean, we do have challenges. Uh, our biggest challenge uh, in organic turf grass management is our climate. So uh, to our regions to our north, bluegrass, and I think, I don't remember if it's in this one or a different packet that we sent you guys, but to our north, Bluegrass is the predominant species, and it's fantastic. Um, to our south, it's Bermuda grass, uh, and it's fantastic. We're, we're in this no man's land, if you will, 
uh, that bluegrass, unfortunately, is very susceptible to disease. And without applying a fungicide to be able to try to control that, um, and it's not like an everyday thing that we're making these applications. Uh, these are when the when the the fungus appears, we're trying to treat. It's not we're not we're not doing this because we want to. We're we're, we're trying to to maintain a plant. Um, so the bluegrass is really struggling in our area. The Bermuda grass at some point kind of struggles. We've got some new varieties, but it's not extremely cold tolerant. And then we have tall fescue. And tall fescue is kind of like what taken over, you know, took over the, the Middle Atlantic region, and it's just not very traffic tolerant compared to the other two grasses. So it's a little bit more disease uh, resistant, but it's not traffic. So in a, in a lawn situation, that's why the University of Maryland recommends tall fescues for lawns. Um, tall fescue, especially at a higher level, is very difficult to maintain. Um, because of the fact it can't recuperate like the other two grasses. Um, we've got some real challenges for our climate that, uh, that need to be addressed, regardless of if funding was a unlimited amount. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I have a list of questions for later, but just on, on this strategy and the, the cost, um, I'm very glad to hear and see the overall pesticide, the purchasing of pesticides, the cost is down that substantially. Really over the last big drop from 14 to 16, and then after the law, down to eight in, in 18 as well. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's the best takeaway, most positive takeaway to come out of the briefing. Um, on the question of moving forward, get it that we're going to have to spend more money to maintain the current standards um, if we want to have to hold you to the standard the rest of the county's at now of moving away from pesticides. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm interested in hearing about the round table and who was in and who was, was out. Um, I'm a fan of advisory committees. I, th I think, you know, we're, we're rich in this area with outside experts who would volunteer their expertise, both industry people and government folks and nonprofit folks that I think you could meet with on an ongoing basis, and I'd be happy to help convene it um, so that, um, we took umbrage at some of the language in the petition so that there would be more sort of um, accurate, you might say, understanding of the challenges in front of you and what you're doing. And that you're, rather than just, you know, I appreciate you went to New York and you got one cost estimate, that is the right thing to do. It might be helpful to get 10 cost estimates and to look at a whole bunch of jurisdictions and to talk to a lot of university and nonprofit and other experts about how to manage this cost going forward. I think we'd all benefit from that kind of spreadsheet where we could see what's Montgomery Parks doing, what are other jurisdictions doing, how many parks, what's their acreage, um, what are the challenges, what are the, you know, is, are they in the same climate as we are, um, so that we could, we could make that decision in future budgets in a, the most informed place, not just having one or two data points. So um, is that a fair suggestion? Do you have anything like that in place, or was there just that one advisory committee, the one roundtable? Yeah, we conducted the roundtable and um, would be happy to share information with you on who was there and the outcomes of that meeting. Sure. And if you need to hire cons expert consultants on this, that's something we should talk about as well. I mean, this is it's a big transition. I understand that. And you all are going to hear from constituents on one side saying, why is there, why are you using so much pesticides? And others saying, why do I see so many weeds in these parks? Um, and we want to help you manage that problem, I think. Mr. Chairman. All right, thanks. So how close are we to wrapping up the presentation? We are close. Close. I'll try to speed it along. Okay, at our nature centers, efforts have been made to maintain... Is your mic, your mic on? I'm sorry. Thank you. Efforts have been made to maintain landscape beds by hand weeding and densely planting native plants. The Friends of Black Hill Nature Programs maintain the landscape beds at Black Hill Visitor Center. Seasonal staff that have been hired to do various tasks to support the nature centers spend 95% of their time with weed removal. An additional staff person is needed to assist. Community gardens have been organic since the program inception in 2009. There are currently 11 community gardens serving over 500 families. Pest reduction <coughs> or elimination efforts include hand weeding, hand picking of insects, row covers, and mulching with various products. This, this photo shows plastic being used as mulch to control weeds. Only organic or listed pesticides can be used in the community gardens. 
Management plans for natural areas minimize pesticide applications. Mechanical removal by hand or machinery is the preferred option and is always used first. In an earlier slide, you saw a forestry mulcher machine used for removing invasives. Weed Warrior volunteers dedicate over 7,000 hours annually for hand removal of weeds. <coughs> That's enormous. I just want to put a, put a pin on how proud we are of this program uh, that Carol Bergman, who's recently retired, uh, started uh, decades ago. Um, this is an enormous amount of our residents volunteer uh, their weekends to be out in our parks trying to help us manage this very difficult program. And it's a great example of how we've tried to approach a problem uh, with mechanical means first before resulting to the application of chemical pesticides. But this is a case where uh, getting to Council Member Friedson's point, all, all the money in the world isn't going to let us eventually start to win on the non-native invasive plant issue if we can't have chemical controls as an option when needed. Well, also, I mean, the entire budget of the Parks Department can't be spent on weeds. There's other things we have to do with the Parks Department. Okay. Okay, Pope Farm Nursery is our plant production facility located up in Gaithersburg. Um, they produce over 40,000 plants annually for parks. Coconut discs are placed in containerized plant pots to reduce weed seed germination. Currently, Pope Farm is testing non-glyphosate products as well as listed products for weed control. Weed control is essential in the nursery to protect young trees and to prevent weeds being transferred to parks when trees are planted in the landscape. Pesticides are not used on 99% of common grass areas. There are approximately 1,600 acres of common grass areas on parkland. Okay, so, you know, why not just go to 100% here? Like, how much more difficult would it be to... This is Brookside is a small... Brookside is the 1%. <laughs> and then we have um, a couple of our elite athletic fields. They don't have... Are using... In the common grass area that's nearby, essentially? Adjacent. It's adjacent. The athletic fields. Yep. Okay, well... I mean, I think you could draw that map into the at competition athletic field and then you do Brookside, and then we're, you know, at 100%. I, I think that would be helpful to say that the kind of place where you just go and run around, you know, is a place that we're not using chemicals. You know, it's, it's when you get into permitted fields and athletic programs that you might, you know, need to be aware if, if you're concerned about that. But that when it comes to your neighborhood park and, and the, the grass there, it's just not happening. It's not going to happen. It would be nice to be able to get to that point. We will, definitely, yeah. we will definitely delve deeper into the Brookside Gardens uh, yeah. okay. potential solution. And just to confirm this a different ways, a different way, the $14,624 you spent on pesticides last, this year, they're all getting applied in 1% of your areas? Or where else? No, this is just common grass areas, so athletic fields. The rest fields, are going on athletic fields or? Racks and courts, fence lines. Got it. They okay. don't have a mow strip, tree rings. Green valleys. Invasives. And, and again, it's, we're talking about pesticides, so it's insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides right. at 14,000. Just keep that in mind as well. With the emerald ash borer? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, but we just treat one tree for the emerald ash borer. It's the champion ash. Oh. We do not so that's do the only one. That's the only one that's, it's... There's effort. another champion green. Go ahead. So my staff manages that program, <laughs> which has been fun. Um, we do treat the champion green ash down in Rock Creek, too. But besides that, no other ash are being treated. But we're spending, like, a million dollars to remove... On removing, the yes, ash, which is going well. Right now, we're finding a lot of trees in backyards, stream valleys, so we're trying to protect patrons that way. Okay, moving along... Oh, athletic fields. Okay. Increased efforts have been made to use mechanical means for weed removal, which includes string trimming, using a scuffle hoe, which is a type of hand hoe that chops the top off of the weed, um, flame weeding, which we've mentioned already. So flame weeding is not the same as the foam stream. It's actually flame coming out of the end of a tool that kind of wilts the, the weed. And then also a weed bar, which is an attachment to the field dragging machine that removes weeds. 
New improved pest resistant turf types are overseeded in existing fields and used for renovations to reduce pesticide applications. All athletic fields are maintained using IPM practices. Physical improvements such as mow strips under fences are being installed as funds are available. And mow strips under fences allow us to, to run the drag machine right up against close to the fence as opposed to when we don't have the mow strip, it's really hard to get those weeds and woody plants that are coming up under the fence line. The mid-Atlantic climate, insect and disease problems, and the heavy demand for fields heavily influences our decisions on maintenance practices and the tools we use to meet standards and customer expectations. To continue and increase our reduction efforts with ball fields, additional staffing and equipment will be needed as well as funding for adding most strips to these fences. Maryland Code 33B directed parks to develop a pilot program for maintaining fields without registered pesticides. In fall of 2018, Montgomery Park solicited proposals from qualified companies. After receiving just one proposal, it was determined that the price was beyond acceptable. This decision and a pilot program alternative were outlined in a letter to the council on April 1st. For the alternative pilot program, park staff identified two fields at Latonia Recreational Park where a side-by-side -side comparison can be made. A team of turf grass experts has been engaged from the University of Maryland. This team will oversee the program implementation and make independent assessments for consistency and field quality. Parks will retain a qualified vendor to implement the program for three years, with options for additional years pending funding and initial results. Quarterly update reports will be provided to Montgomery Park officials each year. As you can see from this graph, pesticide expenditures for parks have decreased significantly from $53,395 in fiscal year 14 to $14,624 in fiscal year 18. This concludes our presentation, and at this time, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, so uh, Pam has prepared a packet. Um, so Pam, why don't you just what what we've we've had a lot of conversation. I think there was some focus on what the law required. Correct. Um, I mean, I think at this point, I, there's been a lot of information given this morning. There is a lot of information also in the packet. Uh, Parks Department was provided with 11 questions to answer, in which they did provide that information, and it was included, so that everyone has it. Um, what I am hearing, and it seems to be the um, place where there's still discussion is the athletic pilot, um, sort of what is the expectation to come back. We know that it's now the side-by-side -side fields. Um, uh, uh, the parks director has said that in starting that more quickly by just doing the two fields allows them to be able to do it this fall, to come back to the council following that with more information. It sounds like um, there's other information they want to bring back to you on some of the things they're starting to implement. Um, so the, the $650,000 bid that you received on the 10 field pilot, um, I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of money. So I don't think the council would approve spending that kind of money on a general maintenance program. You know, $65,000 in athletic field is not something that we're <coughs> going to be able to pay for. But it was, obviously, that's not really what it would cost per field. There was elements of that that, why was that proposal so expensive? Well, we one of the I'll, one thing I'll take responsibility for is that this pilot was to produce meaningful results to guide decisions for you to make about whether we could successfully go organic with all our fields, and so I really challenged my team to structure this as a scientific experiment and try to make sure that as we collected data, that there weren't out of control variables that would you know, be able to be challenged depending on what, what we concluded. And we were extremely disappointed to only get the interest of one bid. Uh, I, I would have thought with the talk around the country about organic lawn care and organic turf care, we would have attracted a lot of different entities to come submit us a proposal. We got one. The price was way beyond what I had imagined. Um, and I also, in retrospect, I know the law said five local park fields. But one of the things that always has bothered me is in a local park field that you were that are allows walk on route use. That one variable alone is going to could destroy any meaningful conclusions. 
we could be doing this experiment perfectly and you could have walk-on adults come on a Saturday in the middle of the rain and destroy. That happens to us on occasion. So uh, the price was prohibitive. We only got one bidder. And now what we're going to do is measure two high-end restricted use fields, which completely removes that variable <coughs> of walk-on use. We're going to use the University of Maryland to be our expert equalizer in observing the results. And of course, I've been fortunate with resources you've given me to be able to hire people like Cliff over the last few years who are experts in this field to help us uh, hopefully come back to you in the spring to begin feeding you meaningful results about what does it mean to go pesticide free on a high end athletic field. All right. Uh, Pam, anything else? Then we'll go to, I know Councilmember Glass has questions. Right. The only other thing I would mention that I've, I've heard today yeah, is. Um, yeah, everybody does. The I think everybody has questions. The interest in coming back with not only a plan based on this pilot, um, looking further at, at Brookside Gardens uh, um, as its use and it also becoming um, pesticide free or going organic or whatever that might mean. Um, those are the main things I think um, that still need to get brought back to council. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we have dialogue? We'll start with uh, Councilmember Glass and uh, Mark our way down. We'll go to those who haven't yet had a chance, and then we'll come back, circle back. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad we had this uh, joint conversation. Uh, having watched from afar and, and having had some of these conversations uh, in committee and with the community, um, I think in the last few weeks I've received uh, three or 400 emails about this topic. Um, so it is something that we're all mindful of. And this, what I'll call compact conversation that we've had, I have a few questions. I'll start at a higher elevation and then get into the weeds. Um, I know, sorry. So, so there was a slide before about state and federal laws that require or mandate some uh, vegetative uh, requirements. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm curious what external requirements are being placed on us that uh, might help or hinder some of this progress. The Maryland Department of Agriculture has law that requires certain weeds to be managed on parkland. For example, thistle is one of them, as mentioned in that slide. And so we typically hire a contractor unless it's you know a small thistle plant that we see that we can manage. Um, we have lots of roadside areas that we need to hire a contractor to come and manage thistle. And if you don't, then you're not meeting the regulations of the state. I think those laws were created for farmers or for agriculture initially. And, and from your viewpoint, would, would it be beneficial to engage our state lawmakers to maybe update those given the, uh, the outcomes that we want being pesticide or herbicide free? I think weeds such as thistle are very difficult, or noxious weeds, are very difficult to control by hand removing. Also, um, listed products, we've been trying those on weeds in the parks that aren't these noxious, tenacious weeds, and it takes many, many applications just to control you know, a, a typical weed that we might see growing out of a crack. So a noxious weed would be very difficult to manage without pesticides. And so, okay, so just to put a fine point on it, the state law requiring us to eradicate noxious weeds is hindering our ability to go totally pesticide, pesticide free. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, you've, you also in, in, in the packet and in conversation have talked about uh, collaboration or at least in um, uh, fact finding missions with Ontario, Seattle and Durango. Um, all beautiful places. I've been to all three of those places. Um, but they are not Montgomery County, Maryland. And so uh, I, I'm glad to hear about the regional roundtable that took place. But uh, aside from that, the fact finding on, on those three uh, nice summer places to go, how do we find more comparable zones, growing zones, climate zones, um, that that more closely resemble Montgomery County and how we want to become pesticide free. Are there examples, let me ask another way, are there examples of other uh, similar locales that, that are uh, comparable to us? Um, 
we're not aware at the moment, but we keep looking for that. I think that's one of our challenges. And I think we've started that by reaching out to other organizations, other parks uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region to find out what they are doing. It's like Cliff has said, it's a difficult region to raise turf and to do a lot of things in regards to plants and being pesticide free and all that. So it's, it's one of our things that we will continue to reach out and see if there is other examples in the Mid-Atlantic region for that. It's not a bad thing that we're leading in this regard, right? Because that's, that's what that information shows. And we have to work doubly as hard to try and come up with best practices since there's no other uh, shining light to follow. So keep, keep working on that. Um, uh, just a few more questions because I know my colleagues have, have a bunch. As I get closer to the ground here, um, the, the pilot program for the 10, the 10 parks, what has the reception been to those being uh, pesticide free with regard to either the residents, users, and even staff? How, how are people finding, finding those locations? I don't believe we've gotten a lot of comments on the pesticide free parks. As far as I know, um, we haven't gotten a lot of comments. As staff find that it's labor intensive to manage the infrastructure in these parks without pesticides. So um, when visiting with the plant health horticulturalists recently, I've seen that's where we really noticed these courts were having issues with the weeds and the cracks and that something needed to be done. Um, in the law, it states that in pesticide-free parks, there are exceptions for pesticide use, which includes invasive plants as one of the exceptions. And I think that we're, we're struggling with that a little bit because we do have a lot of parks where we don't use pesticides except for maybe last resort if there are invasive species. So do we declare it a pesticide-free park and then go in and start managing the invasives mechanically first? And then if we need to use chemical, that's, that's a struggle for us, for the patrons to say, oh, they're using pesticides in a pesticide-free park. So to start declaring this whole list and then having to go back in and use these products, that, that's a real challenge for us. But, but let me answer by saying we do plan, we've collected enough information that we do plan to expand the, pesticide, the number of pesticide-free parks shortly. Um, my, my take, I am not, since we took these parks pesticide-free, what I'm, I'm not getting complaints from the constituents who use the parks. I'm being told by the staff of the extra labor it takes to do the alternatives to what they used to do to keep the park at the maintenance standard it was. So that's not scientific data, but that's kind of my perspective. It's going well enough. There's no Armageddon. And I think we can significantly add to the number of parks that our community members can choose to visit that are pesticide free in the next six months. Is there signage at those parks declaring their pesticide status? Yeah, yeah the entrance, there's a sign. Great. Okay. Um, but no, no complaints from users for whatever they might see or not see at those parks. Yeah. Just at, at my level, and I do get complaints daily, uh, I, I have not got a single complaint from someone who has said there are too many weeds in this park or there's, there's, uh, it doesn't mean they haven't come into the organization, but they're not getting to me. Um, the, the, the law bans cosmetic use. Does that mean beautification as well uh, to, to protect things that are pretty and wanting them to remain pretty? Is that the same as banning cosmetic use? Well, we struggled with this in answering the question from uh, Councilmember Hucker to clarify our position on cosmetic use. And we sent uh, him a letter just the other day that explained we are not using it for cosmetic use unless you consider Brookside Gardens cosmetic use. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit like if you were at an art museum and you had a painting and it had mold growing on it and you removed the mold from the painting with chemicals, would you be treating it for a cosmetic use? Well, the point of the painting is that it's supposed to be, you know, it would compromise its function as a work of art if you were not to remove the, the whatever was growing on the surface of the painting. It's the same thing with Brookside Gardens. We felt that it's not, it's a little bit of a se separate case because the whole point of Brookside Gardens as an enterprise facility is to manage this beautiful uh, garden uh, facility. And if you want to call that cosmetic use, I wouldn't quibble with you, but I don't think it's the same thing as saying we're taking, uh, we're treating dandelions on soccer fields because that's not happening. 
So we wanted to be upfront about that and not try to be cute about what our definition of cosmetic use was, but we, th we believe that it's within the letter and spirit of the law that we can use it at Brookside Gardens to make sure that that facility is what it's supposed to be, which is this very high-end marquee uh, facility. And I, I appreciate the response because I asked the question because that's the esoteric debate, right? Uh, what What is beauty versus functionality in terms of our parks? Is is a ball field with some uh, with some dandelions, is that changing the functionality or is that supposed to be beautification? And, and you elaborated on, on Brookside. Um, being being a destination for the flora and fauna that are there. Right, and I hope if the, you get nothing out of this, you take away that we are not applying chemicals simply to manage the aesthetics of ordinary park facilities, including athletic fields, at all. We're we only time we're using chemicals for athletic fields. It's because we are trying to maintain the turf so it is playable and safe and so kids are not hurting themselves so kids can have access to them and so we don't spend fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars renovating an athletic field because it's been taken over by crabgrass or goosegrass last question I have uh, in the packet it highlighted some various diseases uh, and I'll try and get the pronunciations correct. Brown patch, plithium blight, summer patch, dollar spot, and gray leaf. How have, or how, how does our pesticide status affect um, the, uh, affect those, those various diseases and our management of them? So for the, for the most part, the diseases you read off are cool season turf grass diseases. So uh, I'll start off by saying that, and this is a, a generic number, I apologize, but it's like 96%, 95% of our parks are cool season grass. Okay, so we're starting to expand our Bermuda grass program. Uh, but the diseases uh, are cool season grasses. Uh, we're trying to uh, introduce uh, beneficial biology to the soils uh, during our aerification, seeding, and nutrient program uh, to try to, to reduce the, the requirements of fungicides. Um, if it meets a threshold um, for fungicide application, that's when we make it. Uh, for the most part, we're only making fungicide applications on our highest thin turf. So your local park turf grass, for the, uh, unless I'm wrong and I didn't see anything that was in there over the last, uh, this last report, for any fungicide applications on turf grass. It was predominantly used at Povich, which is tried you know, to be held to a collegiate standard. Uh, in which that if one of these diseases, uh, specifically Pythium, was to hit, it can hit on a Friday, and by the time a turf grass manager comes back on a Monday, he could possibly have lost his entire field. Uh, we're trying to not go that route. So when we see it, again, IPM, we don't apply uh, in advance. What we're applying for is when a pest is present to manage it. And it's not a ratification. It's just to manage the pest. Mm -hmm. it in this conversation, we, we've been talking about the, the fields themselves, the parks, and we haven't even gotten into the other aspects of, of uh, related nature uh, regarding uh, you know, insects and pollinators and all these secondary and tertiary uh, problems that, that we at large are, are facing regarding the use of pesticides and, and, and chemicals. But I think at the heart of it, what we're, what we're doing with these controlled substances are, is trying to change the climate in which we live to create different kinds of grasses, create different kinds of parks. Um, and as we think about climate change uh, in, in the broader sense, we have to be mindful of the changes we're trying to force upon our own county properties here uh, and force within our residential communities. And so I appreciate the work that you've done. I appreciate this this update, uh, and I, I'm getting a sense that we're in agreement that there's more to do, and so whether it's fact-finding from other jurisdictions, uh, best practices regarding technological upgrades, um, or just finding more money uh, to, to get good old manpower, woman power, to, to be able to dig into the dirt and get this done, um, it's something we gotta do. So, thank you all. All right, Councilmember Jawando. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Reamer, and good to see you. Nice to meet some of you. Um, 
stepping back, uh, just wanted to have a couple things that have been mentioned about our current level, our review, our standards, our maintenance level standards. That's been thrown around a couple times in relation to both ball fields, playing fields, and parks. I mean, and uh, playgrounds, for example. So, is is there a place where I could go and see what those maintenance level standards are for each type of field of and or facility that parks maintains? Yes, we submit them every year in our annual budget. We have a section in there for maintenance standards for various park amenities. Okay, so that would be available to the public and it would be on the website as well? It, yes, it would. Okay. And if that doesn't meet, if you look at that and it doesn't meet your needs, let me know. And one of the reasons I asked, I think we're, you know, Councilmember Glass alluded to this a little bit. We're in this discussion of, okay, what is acceptable in the new paradigm? And, and you know, you showed the picture, if, if we could, if, if I test the, the, I won't test the gray button, but if we went back to the um, uh, playground where you had some of your staff removing the weeds from the mulch, I think it was, right? Um, there's a question of, okay, well, what's an acceptable amount of weed and mulch, right? Is, and, and, is, and, and while we understand in the playing field context, there's certainly, I think we have a better handle on, hey, we, you know, athletes, this could be cause injury. It's not, you know, in the winter if it, if it goes away and it's dirt. But what is an acceptable level of, you know, for my kids, assuming it's not poison ivy or something, for example, for them to have some intermingled weeds in their mulch, right? And, and have, so have we, do we have, what's our sense of that? Well, on, on that one, it's, it's relatively straightforward. The whole purpose of that wood fiber mulch, which is another conversation because they're all alter, alternatives to wood fiber mulch that require less maintenance, but they bring their own set of issues, the poured in place rubber surfaces. Sure. There are people who don't like those for a variety of reasons. The majority, the, the problem with weed growth in the wood fiber mulch, it's typically weeds or grasses that germinate very rapidly. They're not there, and then two weeks later they're there. They compromise the shock attenuation, and that's it's the, the main purpose of that wood fiber, is when the kid falls off the highest deck that they have shock attenuation when they, when they land and, and hit their, their head or other parts of their body. So the, the problem with letting the weed uh, growth go unchecked is it binds up the the wood fiber mulch and it compromises its shock attenuation and then of course as the weed, if you, they're unchecked when the weeds eventually die you start mixing in unwanted organic matter into that mulch which also compromises it. Okay. So that's the, in that case the council gave us resources we took a guess <coughs> when uh, back in 2014 what would it cost to go uh, pesticide free this is this is an example where money can solve the issue. We can deliver the same standard that we were with using pesticides without pesticides, but it costs money. And our guess was a little bit low because what my staff is telling me now is we're not reaching, doing the maintenance frequency of the visits to each playground uh, with the resources we have. And to step it up, we need a few more people to be able to have, to keep up with that maintenance standard. So, well, thank you for that. And while I have experienced the shock attenuation, I think that's what you called it, as jumping off of a uh, swing myself or having my kids do that, I didn't, hadn't referred to it in that way. But I, I, I think what I'm asking is if, and if we haven't done this, the reviewing of these standards in light of where we're going, right? And is there an acceptable level that's different that is more cosmetic in nature that doesn't necessarily impact health or safety? And, and I think articulating that and thinking about that more in every scenario where we have, you know, park uh, usage by the public, I think would be helpful as we're having this discussion of what's an acceptable level. Because at some point it's going to, those lines could be blurred, I imagine. And I think I would just recommend if we haven't already, maybe you already have and I just need to read it, but a, an announce, kind of a reviewing of those standards to see is there an acceptable level that might be, it might only take you coming out once a month or, you know, just to maintain that shock absorption level. You know what I'm, do you get where I'm going on this? I think, I, let me just try an example. One of the areas in the past we had used glyphosate was if weeds grow up on a fence. We can let weeds grow up on a fence. Now someone might argue it's unsightly or it's going to lead to premature deterioration of the fence if the weeds eventually grow, get heavy enough that in the wind they pull the fence down. But we can look at things like 
is that acceptable that when people come to a park with a fence that there's weeds growing all over it? And I think this also applies to the new three-tiered ball field uh, uh, thing that we're looking at in a big way. If we go competition, game, and practice, maybe we can decide in that middle group that pesticides will be either eliminated or used only in you know, emergency and preserve their use in the high-end field. So we are going to look at each and every one of these areas where we use pesticides and try to answer that question. What is, because in some cases, money can bring you back to the standard you were at when you were using pesticides. In other cases, our answer will be that it can't. Right. Or that it might not need. Or that you don't, you, right. to your point, you don't need to be at that standard. Right. Exactly. And I think there is a conversation, and that's to my second question, and I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues, or point, rather, and probably a question, is the communication of that as we make this transition. I mean, one of the things I've heard in my office a lot is, you know, what's going on? There's not enough communication. I don't know where these are happening. Um, and what you've provided has been great, and I think it's been helpful. Uh, and I think that's just going to be an ongoing challenge and opportunity for us to how do we can best communicate where we are going on this uh, and how what we're doing over time. And I would just urge you to, I think over communication is the way to go, um, and and to us and to the public at large. And if you need help with that, I know there was you know mentioned in here that uh, there's a public information campaign that uh, you've implemented. I I don't know if that's a firm or you're doing it yourself. Or could you talk about that? But just to my broader point of over communicating, but also this public information campaign. Well, yeah, I was just going to say I, I'm hoping that on the playground specifically, that this vegetable steamer, as uh, Friesen <laughs> called it. Or flamethrower. Yeah. Flame yeah. Well, that's different than flamethrower. That's G.I. Joe. That's, right. that's uh, Mr. Reamer's department. You can try the vegetable steamer. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that will help us out a lot with the uh, playgrounds because it's completely uh, benign as far as, you know, it's not, there's no, nothing toxic about it. However, it looks weird. It sprays this strange foam all over the place, and it sits there for a while. And I guarantee, and the vendor told us this when they demonstrated for us, said, you are going to get park patrons who will call you up and say, what is this crazy foam, and is it toxic, is it safe? It's, and we will do everything in our power to communicate that this is a plant-based foam that will degrade, and it's natural, and it's not a problem, and everything else it's just boiling water, basically. But we could, I think, use your help also because I'm sure you will hear from constituents and say, what the heck is going on? My local park has got this weird foam all over the place and that can't be good. So we, to your point, yes, we need your, we need your help and some of the stuff that we do that will be very progressive from an environmental point of view is not necessarily going to look fantastic, either because there will be weeds growing on things where people are not used to seeing weeds or because even in some cases the, the better more uh, environmentally uh, helpful treatment is doesn't always look cosmetically so great. Sure, sure. In case I don't know if someone wanted to speak to the other, could you talk about the campaign that you've already undertaken and any plans to augment it or improve it or expand it? Yeah, a large part of it is is simply our website. We have a pesticide section that lists the pre-notification. It lists the pesticide-free parks. It lists the initiatives we're taking. We'll carefully review that to see if we need to upgrade that as we uh, go move forward. And then, of course, social media we've used to uh, try to keep people informed. Um, but uh, we are wide open to better ways to involve all stakeholders in this communication do, going forward. Do you send out, if you're going to spray somewhere, and do you send out a social media notice saying, hey, we're going to be in your neighborhood? And is that something that you do? Uh, no, it's list today. It's the, the pre notifications for uh, selected pesticide applications, I believe, are simply listed on our website at 48 hours. And well, that might be something you can. And, and a sign. There's the pre notification on the website, and then there's a sign placed. 48 hours at the site of the application in advance. Okay. Well, if you're planning, you know, as we know, people go traffic to website versus yeah. push out is different. I mean, that might be a low cost <coughs> way, just a suggestion. Um, and, you know, I, I think of the veggie steamer as a carpet cleaner for uh, for weeds. So, you know, as you know, but with a pesticide free carpet cleaner, for, you know, yeah. but um, yeah. anyway, we, that, might, that might not be the thing you want to use. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, thank you very much and look forward to working with you all on this.
We've got three creative analogies for the uh, newfangled technology. Um, we count, yeah, who's up next? All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I venture to guess that that carpet cleaner has uh, stuff in it that you would not necessarily <laughs> want to eat. Um, but I appreciate that we've moved to the, uh, the veggie steamer. I think it's a, a good thing to look at. Uh, a few things. One is uh, one of the questions, and I appreciate all the detailed responses uh, in the packet, some to my questions, some to uh, other questions. Um, one of my questions was specifically focused on what other jurisdictions are doing, and I read your uh, response to it. I don't know if there are uh, others, but I think this is an important piece because sometimes we hear kind of the headline and it says, so-and-so put out a press release saying that they're ending the use of chemicals or they're ending the use of glyphosate or they're ending the use of pesticides. And then it takes a little bit of investigation to realize that except in these 19 circumstances where they still might use them, and so it turns out that they're not necessarily any a, you know, ahead of where we are, you know, quote unquote, or uh, in a different place than uh, than where we are. And when I looked at the uh, three that you mentioned, Ontario, Seattle, and Durango, uh, not only do they seem like much smaller uh, jurisdictions. I mean, I the one you saw. I mean, I'm just guessing. I don't know how big uh, Ontario's Parks Department is. Durango, Colorado, I imagine is uh, is smaller, and uh, Seattle is 6,400 acres to our 37,000. Uh, acres. So, I mean, it's a fraction of, uh, of the size. Um, but all three, it just seemed to me, these are partial, you know, these have, have exceptions to them. And whether those exceptions are appropriate or not appropriate, whether it's the right way to do it or, uh, or there's a better way to do it, I don't, I don't know that. But I think it's important, you know, for us to kind of understand as we have this conversation, is there a place of similar size in the U.S. or Canada that you are aware of that has a complete ban of chemicals in their parks department? We're not aware of that. Okay. That's helpful for me because I think as we have this conversation, I think it's an important conversation of how we can move towards reducing and continue, I think, the effort that you have undertaken which is to figure out ways to reduce the use of chemicals as best as you can while maintaining the core mission of the Parks Department. But uh, there, I think it's important for us to have it in the context of we're not, you know, who are we competing against? And uh, the goalpost is not necessarily, at least the one that I have thought was there, is not necessarily uh, a complete ban always in every circumstance. I mean, there are, it seems to me at least, uh, until I learn otherwise, that there are exceptions uh, everywhere else. So I think that that is uh, really helpful. Yes. Just to add to that, you know, we, we have given you three examples, um, and a lot of them are changing back to the old ways. But what we need, also need to keep in mind is to keep the conversation open with these different organizations, different agencies, different parks, because even though some of their things have failed, they are learning as they go along. A lot of these have been forced to ban pesticides and been forced into doing things they normally don't do. And yet, and, and I agree, some of the things are not working for, for them, but some things are, and we just need to keep the conversation open, go back to Durango, go back to these other places and see what is working, what did they keep and all that. That's just as important as us knowing that it's failed. Well, I learned a long time ago, you learn a lot more from failing than right. you from succeeding. That's so. exactly Hopefully we don't have to fail uh, right. exclusively, right. I mean, we will fail in the things that we try to do, but we can learn from how others uh, fail and what are best practices nationally, and I'm hopeful that you'll continue to uh, get that uh, information. Uh, you mentioned uh, as part of this um, an interest in a work group, and I know uh, Councilmember Hucker had mentioned this too. I'm just curious, it wasn't very specific of what that would look like and who would be part of that, but you know, have you considered, I don't know who this is directed towards and who would kind of be staffing uh, this uh, work group, uh, but have you considered who might be part of that work group and when that might go underway and how folks might we've, get involved in it? You know, we've thought about it in sort of preliminary way, but we'd be open to have, maybe we should, should all talk offline about what that would, what that might look like. Yeah, I think it would be really helpful because I do think that there are a lot of 
not, you know, somewhat conflicting bits of information from all sides here and uh, getting everybody in one room, feeling like they have an opportunity to really share their thoughts and feedback, the research that they've done to uh, Councilmember Hugger's point, I mean, we have a lot of subject matter experts in a lot of different uh, areas that we could utilize for, for free or, uh, you know, that, that I think we, we would all benefit from and I think it would provide the public with uh, a tangible way to provide uh, input that could actually be constructive and productive as opposed to, you know, feeling like we have two different groups that are competing against each other when I think all, you know, mo you know, 95 percent of this is everybody wanting to do something similar, which is how do we fulfill the mission of the Parks Department with the least amount of non-natural uh, uses as possible, and I think we all share that. And I would just uh, only point out that, uh, you know, I was at a, uh, a friend in District 1 uh, residence uh, home recently and uh, he has a you know, he and his wife have a terrific garden and they were providing salad that they had picked from their uh, garden the lettuce that they picked from the garden and he pointed out uh, that if you find a worm you know that it's organic and that we use no pesticides and for some that would be terrific news that they got a worm in their salad and that shows that there was no use of chemicals for others they might have a very different view of what uh, a worm in uh, their salad would be and I only point this out as we have this conversation of you know what level of weeds on fences and others are acceptable and I think that that is different to a lot of people and if you're somebody who uses the parks for your children to run around more recreationally or you're somebody who uses the park in serious competition for athletics if you're a, you know a family who goes and picnics I mean I, there are lots of different uses in our parks department there are lots of different viewpoints on this and so I think that that work group of us all being able to work together and figure out what's the best way to make sure that all stakeholders are including in, the, in this the folks who are using it as athletic fields the folks who are using it you know for family picnics for strolls and, and walks for exercise and you know that we have a broad cross-section of, uh, of, of everybody because I don't think we are hearing from everybody necessarily on this at this point and to have a work group that uh, really pushes for everybody's voice to be heard or at least all the different stakeholders voices uh, to be heard I think would be really helpful so thank you for that <coughs> I'm glad to hear the lead member for parks has such a great idea for the Advisory Committee um, and you're all open work to working with all stakeholders so uh, congratulations um, look forward to participating uh, in that um, just to go back to an earlier point um, Mike, you took on bridge with some of the language in the petition. Have you had a chance to meet with Sierra Club, Safe Grow, Maryland Pesticide Network, anybody that has had concerns about your implementation? Not me personally. I know some members of this team met with Safe Grow years ago, but not recently. Okay. So hopefully some of that we can work out in if we have an advisory committee going forward. Um, on the, I was reviewing the list of pesticide applications that you share with us um, semi-annually. Um, and... I think the advisory committee would also help separate some of these, um, some some of the issues, um, because not all pesticides are the same. And, and the, while there's Roundup on the list, there's also a lot of analogs to round, Roundup on there: generic Roundup, Rodeo, Prosecutor Pro, Ranger Pro, Razor Pro. There's a fair amount, right? And I think there's a lot of concern about glyphosate. That if we could address that and clarify what your strategy is, um, that would be a positive development. Um, you also, I think, have neonics on your list. I was surprised to see them. I'm not sure. Given how many, how much concern there is about colony collapse disorder, and even very large, very very conservative retailers like Walmart and Home Depot won't even sell neonics anymore. So the fact that we're using them in Montgomery Parks, I think, is concerning. Um, but hopefully, we could. Uh, Those are used in the Rose Garden. And it's it's used. Yeah. Yeah. Come on up. I'm Jody Fetzer, the plant health horticulturist, plant pathologist for Montgomery Parks. Mm -hmm. And plants do have a lot of health issues. Um, the neonics, we're really watching them carefully. It's, it's actually a fairly large, well, it's several different types of insecticides that are closely related. Um, and each one has different properties. Mm -hmm. So when we use that as a product, 
we're, we're looking at ways to protect pollinators because there are issues that have been reported with pollinators. And so it's, it, they when we use them, it tends to be under glass, so in closed environments in production houses. Um, we also use it as one very early application in the rose garden when the roses don't just are starting to get leaves and no flowers are present at all in the rose garden. So we look at the timing, the targeting, and actually which particular product and the type of activity. Some of them are active against Lepidoptera, which are caterpillars. Some of them have very little activity against Lepidoptera. So it's depending on which neonic. So we're looking at it like in a splitting hairs science kind of way. Okay, thank you. That's, that's helpful. It might be a longer conversation, but that, that mm -hmm. I guess is a good place to start. Um, the $15,000 spent um, this year on pesticides, can you just, can, I know that's the number you sent over, so you must believe in it, but can you confirm you don't buy or are using up other stockpiles of pesticides purchased from any other stream of revenue? That's the exact question we had when we found those figures. Uh -huh. uh, when, we found, when our budget people sent us those figures, it's the first thing Holly and I thought of, what about the storage areas for pesticides? So Jody Fetzer, who you just met, uh -huh. has eyes on those storage facilities uh, twice, three times a year. She can tell you um, pretty much what's in those uh, lockers at all times, and there is no large stock stockpiles of Roundup or anything that we've stockpiled over the years. And you're confident in that number? I'm, I'm, I'm very confident. So like PTA activists bring school supplies to school, trying to be helpful. What if a do you have any friends or parks users that would show up with pesticides ever when they see some weeds and try to be helpful? How would you I, that? Okay, that, ha that hasn't happened. I can't guarantee that that doesn't happen. Okay. Um, that could happen. It's a large park system for us yeah. to have eyes on every park out there. I haven't well, seen this. I haven't, I, haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen this no, either, but uh, I just wanted to. I've seen a lot of things in park parks. trail yesterday, uh -huh. and we were crossing a bridge that Nobody can identify who put the bridge in. Like, apparently, some park users went in and built the bridge. I'm wow. talking like a bridge that spans probably a, a 10 foot, you know, sort of a stream, stream and stream, stream bed. So, yeah. people will do things in the parks, and you just, you yeah, know, who knows? Um, so, Mike, thanks for your recent letter um, about glyphosate and the use for cosmetic purposes. Um, back to you on your, there, there's, I know concern uh, that it's still being used uh, for uh, addressing invasives or other things that, in in a way that um, that you're using the exceptions in the law. Um, can you can you explain a little bit more? Like if you look at the your report, your, the semi-annual one, um, most of the application just says weeds, and we we kind of started the briefing there. What's weed, the way you're defining it now? And it might be helpful in future reports to have more elaboration on that. Is a violet a weed? Is plantain a weed? Is a clover a weed? All those can be weeds, but again, if a weed is in a place where you don't want, if a plant is in a place you don't want, it can be considered a weed. Um, magnolia tree can be considered a weed on that. But um, getting back to your point about the weeds on our list right now, that's one thing that uh, we noticed a couple of weeks ago that we want to change. We want more detail in our report, which will come to you in the next report. Instead of just saying weeds, uh, we, want to, we want to be able to put the type of weed and also the location. If you look on the list right now, it just gives you a park. We want to be able to identify whether it's in a tree circle, if it's in a parking lot, if it's on a courtyard, or whatever. So that gives you more detail uh, and we'll hope uh, it will help people that are looking at this list understand what we're doing as well, too. Uh, again, getting back to everybody gets a lot of uh, letters and emails and all that. It may cut down on some of that if people understand more, if we're right. more transparent. Thank you. Yeah, tree, tree mulcherings aren't, don't appear here at all. Right, and yet the Very park easy. does. Uh, well, that's part of the reason. The park, it says weeds in the specific part, but if we were to be, give a more specific example and flesh that out more, it would say the park, the weed, the application, the chemical used, and also where in that park it was used. That's the kind of detail we want to provide for the next report. Okay. Um, and Mike, I saw your recent correspondence with Ms. Tan from the Sierra Club, and you have an announcement you're going to do something differently and um, practice greater transparency after July 1st. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, what I learned when I got uh, contacted about uh, citizen found a, a, a yellow sign that a pesticide had been applied, went back to our website, and there had been no pre-notification that my team 
had interpreted the law to read that certain applications were exempt from pre-notification. Um, once I understood that, I directed them that going forward that we're going to pre-notify 48 hours in advance on both our website and at the site with a white sign. Uh, we're going to pre-notify in all cases going forward from July 1st. Right. Now I just want to clarify that in the six-month reporting, those applications appear. Uh, the, the, it's just that we were not pre-notifying in all cases. Thanks. On the, the reports that we get um, semi-annually to the council, are there discrepancies between those and what appears on your website? Good question. Um, the problem that we have with pre-notification is the weather. So if I'm a staff member out in one of the parks and I plan on spraying next week, I will send a pre-notification to the website 48 hours in advance, or maybe sometimes 72 hours. That will be put on the website and it starts raining and it rains for three or four more days. And it gets to a point where I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I just cancel it. That's the problem we have that uh, we have this large, we have a discrepancy with the notification list, but not the final list that comes to you. The final list that comes to you is the actual applications done. If that makes, mm -hmm. if that clears it up a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm also concerned about this. Um, one of the recent pesticide applications listed on your website in Cabin John, what is dihydrogen monoxide? We'll get back to you on that. We'll do some research. It's water. You all list water as a pesticide on your, on your report of pesticides used, particularly in Cabin John Regional Park. Are you familiar with the dihydrogen monoxide parity? Somebody in your staff is. Because it's a well-known, contemptuous chemical industry parity that is used to suggest that environmentalists are fools that don't understand science. Um, and that if you look at, there's numerous websites about it. There's 318,000 citations on Google. But you can um, see on one common one, that um, water is dihydrogen monoxide can cause death if it's inhaled in small quantities, that prolonged exposure causes tissue damage, that it's a major component of acid rain, that it can contribute to soil erosion and lead to oxidation of metals. And we're talking about water. That appears as a pesticide on your report. Can you tell me why? Can you point me to, point us to Montgomery uh, Cabin John Athletic Area, Povich Field, field number two, seven one to seven seven this year. Is it for reducing stress? Yeah, I water my lawn to reduce stress too. Seven one to seven seven. Well, I'm sorry, I have no knowledge of the chemical you're you're reporting to. This is something we're gonna have to research and get back to you. It's not a chemical though, it's water. That's what I'm telling. So it's not in the the Pam has our report in your the end of your packet of applications. Is this a pre notification someone saw on our website? No, it's the scheduled pesticide applications. Yeah. That's a pre notification okay. of yeah. something this, so someone took a screenshot of our a pre notification of our website. We're, um, we'll check we'll check into it. We will check into it and reply back to all of you. You understand it gives the impression that you think the reporting requirement is a joke and maybe you wanna Explain to the public. You don't. I, I hope none of my staff have played a joke. I, I just I can't respond to this. Okay. I, I will say that water can be used as a pesticide. The way it's defined, the way a pesticide is inherently defined, is to deter or, or manage a pest. Um, we'll need to get some additional information, system, right? but I understand. But I think then it would be listed as water. Not as dihyd. No, no chemist uses the term dihydrogen monoxide. Um, are you, uh, do you have any plans, Mike, to move forward with the, to expand the 10 pesticide free parks in the next few years? Absolutely. So, well, before we come back in the next six month report, we will have added a significant number of parks to that program. And regarding the scaled back organic playing field pilot, um, you said you were very disappointed that you only received one, one um, proposal. Did you reach out to which, how many companies did you reach out to? Uh, we, Cliff, can you speak to that? We, we talked to a number of companies in the industry to try to alert them that it was on the website for a competitive bid. Unfortunately, we only received one. 
uh, in the number of you reached out to? I don't know, six to eight, eight to ten. Um, I mean, there's not that many companies in the general area that perform these type of athletic field services. Um, <clears throat> but we had the, the major, essentially the major players in the game all were aware of it. Huh. Okay. Sorry, did I, I didn't mean, did you have something? Um, the way you responded to the, the law requires the five playing fields. Um, you added the t additional five and then put the solicitation out for 10. So you have five control fields. And that obviously then had the impact of increasing the cost to a point where we couldn't really go forward with $650,000. Wouldn't it have been fair to just use any of the other five playing fields that you treat currently with pesticides as the control group? No, our, our, big, our big goal was to avoid conclusions that could be challenged. We wanted one entity, and that's one of the reasons I think it was so expensive. We wanted <coughs> one entity to have some very specific specifications and requirements to document all practices and re results uh, so that the, the, the results and the data would be meaningful. We felt that if we had a contractor doing five organic fields and the park staff over on the side doing th five fields the way they've normally done it, <coughs> that we would leave ourselves way too wide open for the results to be challenged. I, I think it might have been better to come to the council for guidance to say, look, we're not headed toward complying with your intent of the, the law you passed. Um, what should we do? Um, now, we're, now we're sort of in this unfortunate position. But, um, and I, I'm, I think I'm glad you're working with the University of Maryland. Do they have expertise on managing turf fields pesticide free and specifically in transitioning from one to the other? Cliff. So they've done quite a bit of research using organic methods, <clears throat> both in the, uh, the test plots that they have at the University of Maryland as well as like real life applications, specifically on golf courses for the most part. Uh, but in a transition method as well as recording some of the successes uh, with some of the products. Uh, we and they both felt very confident that they would be able to uh, successfully write the plan, uh, review the plan, and then implement uh, for uh, data collection. Could you share that proposal with us just so we could sure. review your requirements? Thanks. Um, and then last question. Um, I, I recently became aware of the 20-year-old law, state law, governing the use of pesticides on school properties, on grounds. Um, now that you're managing a bunch of school properties as well, how are you doing things differently there than you do in county properties? So our school's contract that we currently have, is, uh, <clears throat> a little bit over 200 fields, uh, specifically states that there's no pesticides allowed as the use of that uh, management of that property period. For any school properties? For any school property. We are not the property owner and we are performing maintenance if something occurs in which something needs to be made, an application needs to be made, uh, we would contact MCPS to, to follow through with that. That's outside of our scope of our contract. Okay. All right, thank you very much. It's very helpful. Okay, so in other words, does that mean that those 200 fields are maintained pesticide free or MCPS decides what to do and they do something if they feel that they need to? MCPS would be the applicator in that situation that uh, we've, didn't feel like it was it was our place to be able to make the application as not being the property owner. So uh, we do the purification, seeding, fertilizing, mowing, dragging, lining. Okay. Uh, they handle uh, <coughs> the pest applications. Okay. Uh, great discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do want to second, and I know you're working towards this, more details in the report. I, I think you can't underestimate how the, the misinformation, you know, that the parks would be out there just spraying for dandelions, right? That, that is a, a visual image that almost every homeowner sort of intuitively gets because they've made that decision themselves whether they're going to do that or not. And so they, if they think when they see weeds, you know, control for weeds, they, that's probably what a lot of people imagine is you're walking around, you know, with, with, with a spraying applicator and you're just squirting all the weeds. Uh, which sadly is what people do, and that's one of the reasons why we really felt we had to pass the law that we did, because people don't use these chemicals in a, in a safe manner on their own. Uh, but professional application is a different thing. But, you know, we need you to 
provide more information about what you're doing. So, for example, you know, keeping an infield, you know, dirt. Uh, that's relevant information that explains, oh, they're not wandering around the outfield spraying at every patch of weeds. They're, there's a specific enterprise here. Or the mulch rings. Uh, now, mulch rings on a playground, none of that, right? There, that's not, that, that never happens, uh, the mulch in the playground. And, and so when you say there's an application at a park, people might not realize that that under no circumstances is the playground. So you know, I think there's a better story here than you're telling. And I certainly think you're a national leader on pesticide reduction. And I'm proud that you're doing that. I appreciate your work. This is an ongoing process. This is an aspiration. This is going to be a constantly evolving working program uh, to minimize use of application of chemicals to adopt best practices. Uh, I do want to just, I see Bob Sissel moving around. I do concur with your conclusion about the agricultural use. I think that is, that's the reality of the situation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you made the, you sent, you sent the right message there that, that this does not apply to agricultural used park property. Um, it, you know, if you need something more from us on that. Um, but uh, we, the idea of an advisory board is very interesting. Um, you know, certainly I'm, I'm open to that. Um, and uh, I think council members have asked all of their questions. Uh, so I appreciate what you're doing. We'll, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you very much. And we're wrapped up for today. Very Thank helpful. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. As we care about uh, the environment and climate change, we need to be serious about making sure that we have sustainable farming. And our farms here do a great job of being stewards of our environment. Uh, they are vested in making sure that our environment is healthy because if it's not, they're out of business. And it's important that folks understand and realize uh, that they are true partners with us uh, when it comes to this overall effort. And so I just really want to thank them